imagine you know six minds working on your problem as opposed to one. What's the chances of finding a best solution when you have more people working on it? Welcome to the Owner's Pride Podcast, where we bring you insights, tips, and stories from successful entrepreneurs who have achieved remarkable success in their businesses. In today's episode, we're thrilled to have a very special guest, Mike Michalowicz, motorbike Mike Michalowicz, a renowned speaker, author of several best-selling books, including Profit First, The Pumpkin Plan, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, Fix This Next, and Get Different. Throughout his career, Mike has made a name for himself by helping business owners improve their profitability and efficiency and overall success. He's known for his straightforward, no-nonsense approach to entrepreneurship, and his insights have been featured in numerous media outlets, including CNBC, Incorporated Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. In this episode, Mike will share his expert advice on how to transform your business by implementing proven strategies, including the Profit First Method, which has helped thousands of business owners achieve financial freedom and success. So if you're ready to learn from one of the most influential entrepreneurs of our time, sit back and take a listen, because here we go. Mike, thank you so much for joining me on the Owner's Pride podcast. This is- Oh, Dan, it's a joy to be with you. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, it's so cool. So it's like, um, I know that people who listen to the podcast and then I run into them and I haven't met them, but they feel like they already know me because they listen to me talk and stuff. That's so cool. Yeah. And I feel the exact same way. So I'm looking at you and it's like, oh, it's kind of surreal. <laughs> really cool. And we're about the same age. So we're kind of on the same, on the same oh, we're both page. In our 20s? I didn't realize that. Exactly. Well, I, I, I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> <laughs> Good comeback. <laughs> All right, man. So I, I want to start, I want to dive right in and we're going to hit on some of your books and some of that stuff too. But the first thing I want to talk about is um your company, you have... um. With, with the profit first, um, yeah. where they do coaching and mentoring, yes. correct? Mm-hmm. So I've been Sweet. looking into getting coaching. And I also, I coach a lot of the guys in the Owner's Pride Installer Network. And if you start researching for coaches, it becomes really overwhelming. And they start coming at you like zombies. Like it's I know, I know, I know, insane. I know. And so you got all of these people, both young and old, successful and and not proven track records, and everybody right. wants to take your money. You got life right. coaches, you've got business coaches, you've got people who do sales coaching and PR people and podcast coaches. Yeah. Where does somebody really and you and you have to keep learning your whole career? I you know. So do you have a coach? First of all, I do. You know, as you're going through that list of coaches, is that commercial that guy who coaches children who've become their parents. I don't know if you've seen that commercial, but uh, there's like coaches everywhere. So yeah, the answer, the short answer is yes, I do have a coach and will for the rest of my business career. Well, how, how do you choose who to have? Like, I'm serious. I feel like it's zombies attacking me and I get on a call with these people and, and nobody really, really seems to have some solid silver bullet answer. And and I know yeah. from when I coach people, all I can really do is kind of give them ideas, point them in the right direction and gently nudge them from behind. I, I call it fractionalization. And I don't know if that's a legit word, but how I phrase that term is I think every individual has a specific value that I can extract from them that brings significance to me. Um, but I need to identify what it is. So I have a mix of coaches, some formal and most are informal, but, uh, you know, I have a friend who just has a really wonderful relationship with his wife and I aspire to sustain, maintain the same thing. So he's my coach on relationships. Uh, I have someone else that's a, a really good with finances, like knows numbers inside and out, um, for personal finances. And like, that's my financial coach. I have a, a another coach who successfully grew a business, um, to a very large size. And I don't necessarily want to have a large size for my business, but I do want to have the growth that he's achieved in that the, the employees were empowered and it was just a beautiful work environment and so forth. So Frank is my business coach for that, that element. I think the mistake I tried to make in the past was, Oh, try to find the perfect person to make me a little more perfect. And there is no such thing. So I just look for the, the narrow vertical where they can introduce experience um, training ideas that I don't have. And they're, they are way ahead of me in that game. And you have to be really willing to take whatever they're saying and, and move with it, not just 
sit in there and listen to him and then go right back into your complacency where you're all oh, right right oh it was a wonderful conversation but i'm not gonna move yeah no question you gotta move on it but you also have to find common threads like i listen to my coaches and sometimes i hear conflicting opinions and i'm like well which one's the right opinion well the right opinion your heart will find it i just keep on listening more and more at a certain point i see this pattern and, and you had that experience at a certain point something hits you and you're like, oh my god that that was it i and even though you've heard it a hundred times, this is the time it landed. That's because it's a common thread, and finally, finally, it, it pulled through the through your, in your mind. So, uh, listen for conflicting opinions. That's okay. Listen to your heart to find. I think what the true direction is that you should take. Yeah. Now, when I'm doing my coaching, I, um, you know, I talk, I give a lot of these guys books. And a lot of the guys that we work with specifically are in the detail industry. As a matter of fact, my friend Jason Barker, who I was just hanging out with at Mobile Tech Expo, oh, you yeah. actually talked about him in your in the book that in the uh, forward of I your book. Picture in my book. Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. I a- yeah. <laughs> so we had we had a good time talking about me doing this thing and I talked to him this morning and, and, but anyway so I I send a lot of people to listen to books and I kind of have my way of of where they are in their business journey of where I'm going to send them um you know whether it's a, something about leadership and and it goes to Jim Collins which is a little bit dry but a freaking incredible book good to great um I usually start people with Donald Miller building a story brand so they can oh, so kind of have that customer experience you know yeah, so way Joey Coleman when we're going to talk about customer oh. service oh god yeah and of course the e-myth right so mm-hmm. in, in your books like say somebody's already kind of down the road like a lot of our detailers, it's an easy entry to get into detailing. So maybe they didn't go to school and they just got a bucket and some soap and they started washing cars. And they've been in business for six months, a year, five years. And they're mm-hmm. starting to look for structure. Where would you start somebody in your in your books who was in that situation where they're already in business and they're maybe not doing everything right, but, there are, but yeah. it's functioning? Yeah, I, I start with... Two approaches. I, I consider two approaches. The first approach is when I'm talking to someone, I'm like, well, what's the biggest problem you have now? What's the biggest impedance or challenge in your business? And if they can say, oh, you know what, we're, we're surviving check by check. Um, oh, maybe profit first will help you. Or I struggle to, to retain people and, and make this business efficient. Maybe clockwork would help you. So if they know what their biggest challenge is, um, maybe I've written a book that can serve that and I would invite them to do that. If they don't know, and that's the most common scenario, they like, I don't I don't know what my problem is. I just know my business isn't growing. That's why I wrote Fix This Next. And Fix This Next is a tool I developed to identify, pinpoint where your business is being linchpinned, where it's where it's where it's struggling. And when you can resolve that one big problem, then you can identify what the next need is and the next. So fix this next is a tool to sequence what you should work on and when you should work on it when you don't know what it should be. Excellent. So fix this next for the guys who are out there who are already chugging along and want to dial in where they need to set their focus. I like it. I like it. All right. My friend Thomas Garola, I have three friends who are like really huge book guys. And um, Thomas Garola, Houston Paint Protection in Houston, um, he sent me a question and and he wanted to know if... um, because this is like a much smaller solopreneur kind of business. And a lot of the stuff that you talk about is maybe larger business, even maybe where there's a board that like helps make decisions. What kind of lessons from a larger corporate America type of job would filter down and help detailers in a sole or a solopreneur make decisions? Yeah. Well, one of the things is you can have a board. It just doesn't need to be your own team uh, or your own employees. And it doesn't need to be people you pay for. I would start hands down a peer to peer support group and I would find other local business owners, particularly who are not in detailing um, that you want diversity. Cause then you get different opinions and experiences and I'd meet once a month, ideally face to face and just everyone puts their challenge on the table and then everyone shares how they've resolved problems like that in the past. Imagine, you know, six minds working on your problem as opposed to one, What's the chances of finding a best solution when you have more people working on it? So I would absolutely take that. I think another thing from big corporations that translates to small business, and I never see small business do it, but gosh, we have to. It's taking quarterly profit distributions. Wow. Now, I'm not necessarily a uh, fan of big business, I don't, meaning I don't aspire to have a big business, but I do admire what Ford and Google and all these major companies have done. 
And one thing I've discovered in researching those businesses are they have absolute fiscal discipline. I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of employees on payroll. You, you can't miss a beat. You've got to have those numbers perfected. And one of the fiscal lessons from large corporations is reward the shareholder. Every 90 days, most public corporations do a distribution to their shareholder community. And they know that if you do this every 90 days, you'll keep your shareholders engaged. You know, they're taking big risks. The value could go up in the company, the stock, or could decline. But we, as small business owners, you own all the stock in your detailing business. You own 100%, or maybe you have a partner, you own 50%. You own a lot of stock, and we need to keep you engaged. Now, this is something beyond a salary. You must take a normalized salary. You must be paid for the work you do in the business. This is as a bonus on top, but it needs to happen every 90 days. It's not something that we do once a week or something, because then we see it as a salary. We come to expect it, and we live our lifestyle off it. It's not something you do once a year. You don't take profit once a year, because now it's so far out, you never get there, uh, and there's nothing tantalizing. But we do every 90, day, 90 days. It's just around the corner. You know the next profit distribution is coming out, and then once you earn it and you take it, then the next one's only 90 days away again. So it keeps us moving forward, but we don't normalize our lifestyle to it. So it feels like a true reward. So that's the other lesson I take from big corporations. Okay. Now, this this one comes from Will Zamstutz, who has Windows and Wheels in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm. And um, he has a page on Facebook called Profit First for Detailers. And the funny nice. thing, yeah, I did a, a podcast with him because he's really implemented that system into his business and thrived oh, really, really well. But he asked me if there was any new techniques coming out or anything more than those five pillars um, of accounts that that he's got set up or anything new techniques that you've developed or ideas moving forward. Yeah, I do have some. Uh, and I, maybe I'll go to a future book. I might write Profit First Advanced or something. I, I don't know yet. But when I go and do public speaking, I share a lot of the advanced techniques. So the foundational five must stay in place. Uh, these are accounts, just to give a, a rudimentary understanding, is when you log into your bank account, if you do that now to see how much money you have, we can get this illusion that all the money that's sitting there is available for our next need. I need to buy new equipment or gear or whatever. The problem is that money has multiple responsibilities. A portion is used to pay you, the owner. A portion goes to tax liabilities and so forth. So we carve the money up and ultimately we call it the five foundational accounts. But one of my favorite additional accounts you can add to that is called the new employee account. How this came about is a lot of small businesses as we're operating the business, we are working so hard as the owner, we're like, gosh, I need to hire someone. But on the other side, we're like, I don't know if I can afford to hire them. So we stay stuck in this like purgatory of I need, but I can't afford. Maybe I can't afford, but I won't take as much money, but I do need someone. And we stay stuck here, just continue to drone on. So here's what you do. Set up an account at your bank, call it new employee. Allocate a percentage of money from your income revenue, you know, from your revenue that's coming in, your cash flow, to this account that represents paying the new employee. What would this new employee cost? 30000 a year. I'm just picking a number. So say it's 30000 a year. Every quarter, you got to, I mean, I'm sorry, every month, you got to be putting in 2500 bucks to maybe 3000 bucks to cover their overhead. So every month, can I keep on putting in 3000 into this new employee account? If I can't sustain that, I know my business isn't cash flow ready for it. If I can sustain it, I prove, okay, I can afford to pay this employee before ever hiring them or even interviewing for them. Now, here's the beauty. When you hire the person, now you know you can afford them, but you've also accumulated this cash on the sideline. So there's not this panic, like you got to start working immediately. You can now train them the skills or give them the skills. You can train them up and they can get really proficient at what you do and you're not panicked. So that new employee account is one of my favorites to add to profit first. And and actually, you're not even getting the profitability out of having that customer there doing the work for you where they're bringing in the additional revenue. So it's like a double. Yeah. Two shoulders brushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, in your experience, I, I've, I've seen people, and it doesn't seem to matter whether it's uh, what their race, religion, sex, any of that is. Some people are just wired to be entrepreneurs. Some people are just wired to yeah. be successful and they have a drive. Mm -hmm. uh, what what is it that you've seen that actually gives somebody that that push or that motivation? Is there like one underlying or or overlying maybe factor that that you see in people that makes them a success? Yeah, it, I, there is a common factor, and it's it's fear. But the, here's the crazy thing: it's on both sides. 
So the people who I see who are afraid to become entrepreneurs have a fear of the risk. But on the flip side, I see entrepreneurs who are afraid not to try it out. They're afraid of just reverting back to a less, lesser self is not the right term, but to never explore their fullest self. That's probably a better way of phrasing it. So it's interesting. Both are rooted in fear. They just see this same coin from the two different sides. These, entre- these wannabe entrepreneurs who say, I can't do it. I'm going to risk everything. T- as time drones on, they prove themselves right. They usually have more responsibility. Maybe they start a family. Uh, they own a home. There's more and more responsibility. It feels riskier and riskier to start a business. On the flip side, I find entrepreneurs are, they're so afraid of living the status quo life. They say, I, I got to live something bigger. And, and I think most of them understand it may not work out, but we have this overconfidence. If we don't try, it'll never work out. So we're going to give it a shot. And the odds are now in our favor. If I don't do it. I'm never going to have the success I just defined for myself. If I do do it, I may have the success I defined for myself. So I'm afraid not to try. So they try. Okay. So when I was listening to Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, um, you, you got to a part where you were um, talking about you were having lunch um, with um, with uh, the E Myth. Um, oh yeah, Brian, uh, Michael Gerber. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, uh, and and so and it, it was really cool because you know you said you're like hey scaling your business like he like he almost makes it seem like it's like a really quick overnight thing and you said it's really a slow thing that you have to step into. Yeah. How, how do you know when you're growing and you're like, you know, starting to lose your hair? Um, like at what point is it that you really need to start to scale your business? And what's the smartest way to start to try to do that? Yeah, it, it does start happen immediately. I'll flash back to that conversation. I remember it. We were in Mexico. Michael Gerber and I were both uh, at an event speaking. Um, and he uh, is about 10, 15 years ago. And we went out to dinner afterwards. And I remember talking about E-Myth. I love that book because the thesis is don't work in the business, work on the business. It's just so clear what our responsibility is. So I said, Michael, how successful is it? He goes, you know, there's a frustration. He said, so many entrepreneurs think that if you simply work in the business long enough, that this switch kind of happens on automatic, that you can work on the business. So they think it's just work, work your work to the, your bones, you know, work excruciatingly hard and the business will run on automatic, but it's actually the reverse. The harder you work in the business, the more you entrench yourself, the more the business becomes dependent upon you. So I started to study this, and when I wrote Clockwork specifically, I found the way to extract ourselves. It starts today, to answer the other part of your question. We start scaling a business today, and it's by fractionalizing ourselves. As a small business owner of a detailing shop, you may be doing some of the jobs yourself, you may be booking the customers and handling scheduling. You may be invoicing, collections, uh, all that stuff. Well, of all those things, what's the first thing you can get off your plate? And I suggest taking something off that someone else could more easily do. So if the technical hard stuff is the detailing, I wouldn't hand off the detailing just yet. Maybe the scheduling is a little bit easier. I would start there. And we got to find someone else to do it. Now, it could be an employee that you employ directly. It could be someone that is like a virtual assistant or something. But find them and start using them. The importance behind this is it's not just about them doing the work. It's about you learning how to delegate work. It is a real challenge for most small business owners. Most of us don't delegate. We micromanage. We tell people to do something and then we're watching over it. So in fact, we give ourselves a burden of more work because now we're monitoring while trying to do something. We dilute ourselves. So we have to learn how to delegate. We start with something easy and small. And then you start building your way up. The ultimate test, and for so many business owners, this can take a year or two to get there, but you must start today and you must be disciplined to keep on signing out. Stop asking, how am I going to get this work done? Start asking, who is going to get this work done? Then 18 months out, a year and a half, maybe two years out, have a four-week vacation booked. I find this to be the ultimate acid test. You can leave your business for four consecutive weeks, no physical connection, no digital connection, and the business can operate in your absence the business likely can run on to perpetuity without you. So that's the ultimate goal. So we're going to start working that way towards four-week vacation. But by declaring this break from your business, you have to start thinking like an owner and stop thinking like an operator. Okay. So a lot in, in Profit First, you talk about these pillars of putting your money into. And, and you kind of touch on, but you don't really dive into saving for retirement. And one of the things that the people who have their own business, you know, all the guys that I talk to, 
I'm going to sell this business one day, but there's, yeah. there's really no guarantee that that's ever going to happen. Yeah. And my pops drilled into my head from an early age, which I didn't listen to until I got in my thirties, but he was always like, pay yourself first. And you put this money aside and this is going to be what, what sustains you later in life. And I see so, so, so many people not doing that. Well, how do you feel on just the retirement aspect of the, of the pillars? Yeah. Well, he, he sounds like he's a good man. Give you good direction. I concur. I have found that uh, many business owners think they have an asset that's they're going to sell, make lots of money. And that happens less than 0.1% of the time. So few businesses own, uh, get sold. Most of them uh, kind of go into the, the ether. They just kind of fade away. Some get rid of a few assets, but they never make any substantial money. So planning to spell your, send your business, uh, sell your business is, is hopeful, but it rarely happens. Statistically, you have to be really appealing and there has to be buyers in the market. You don't know what the market's going to be. So you have to match up with people that actually want that business. So the better way is reserve for your future. Um, how I do it is in profit first in our business. Every time money comes in, we take a predetermined percentage as profit. Well, profit gets distributed to the shareholders, like I was talking about earlier. When the money ultimately comes to me, I take a large portion of it and immediately goes into savings. Um, it's interesting. I'm not trying to save everything because I also realize that I can go too extreme. If I save everything for the future, well, what if I die tomorrow? Yeah. I, I've lost the potential to use this as an experience. So everyone has their own, I guess, tolerance or balance that they try to strike. Um, but I put about two, about one third to almost a half of the income that comes to me goes into savings. It's more about one third, I should say. And then the other two thirds are used to live in the moment and experience it. Um, and that so far seems to be working for me. I, I have confidence in my future currently. Um, and uh, I'm not at the point, though, if I stop working today, that I can sustain my current lifestyle. I'd probably have to step it down. But I could definitely could sustain a lifestyle of comfort now. Uh, and my goal is to get to a level that I can sustain my current lifestyle into perpetuity. And if I keep putting away that one third, uh, at least for me, in my state of life and my objectives, that's going to work out, I think, pretty well. Okay. A conversation that I had recently with one of my guys who was looking on bringing somebody into his business as an equity partner, but he really kind of didn't have a really very good grasp on anything. I'm like, well, what would that person do? What does this even look like? Yeah. Um, and then in, in Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, you you really highly advised against doing that. And you, I believe you called yeah. it the DIY or something, the person that you bring in who kind of has the experience and you give them equity, which I was exactly that person for my company. But I have a very good heart and I've performed well for them. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Man, I got my equity position and I'm super happy and super happy to be on my part of my team with uh, Damon Gray, the founder of my company who brought me on. Oh, but, cool. What, at, at what point, and, and I don't really think I've heard this part talked about, when you're going to do something like that and make a really big move, yeah. having a lawyer is imperative, I think. At, at what point do you think it's important for a guy with a small business who's signing contracts and, and making these kind of moves to bring a lawyer onto their team? Oh, br bring a lawyer in immediately. And the interesting thing is not only the legalese. It's the codifying, it's the extraction of really what your intention is and expectations are. I think that's the biggest thing that's missed out on. So first of all, why, we, why do we bring on partners? It's usually a shoulder to cry on. It's usually like, oh, this is so hard. If I had someone else going through this misery with me, I'd feel better. And you usually do for about a year. But after you see us through for a year, it's like, oh my God, this person's not working. They're not doing anything. I'm now doing double time to cover Yucko the Clown over there. So it, it gets really frustrating. So what's your expectations for performance from yourself and from your new partner for the long haul? And then if it's not being delivered on, what are the consequences? And a lawyer can codify that. They can put that into your document. It rarely is. It's usually just you get 50%, I get 50%, everyone does their best. And that, that's not sustainable for a long period. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a specific hack I wrote in The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. And what it is, is when you give someone new equity, uh, and realize, by the way, as a small business, it's really easy to give away equity. It costs nothing until your business grows, now has some value, now it's really costly. So instead say, uh, you are you can earn up to X percent, 25, 30% of equity, but to get that, here's the milestones you meet, need to meet over a period of time. So don't just say, you know, show up to work on time for the next three days, because anyone can do that. Show up to work on time every time for the next three years and that earns you a one or 2% point. Uh, you know, 
do this many projects or sell this many jobs and you get another 3%. So put down the performance parameters over an extended period of time for them to earn that equity, to sweat their way in to that equity. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. That's actually how mine was. There was metrics oh, that, you had to, that you had to hit to do it. It wasn't completely willy-nilly. Um, okay, one of my biggest passion plays that I have in in the coaching and stuff that I do is getting these guys to use a CRM and have a sales process. Now, in knowing that you're in, in your early 50s also, when we started in business, we really did not have CRMs and stuff like that. Um, what, yeah. what role does that play in your business? And can you imagine doing business in this day and age without? No, CRMs are critical. Um, it plays a small role in my personal work. I position myself to be a business owner. I don't interface with our clients. I do interface with readers, but not our clients or our businesses. So we have, uh, I have different businesses. We have different CRMs. It just happens to be uh, for these different businesses. But it's the way of understanding their history. It's the way of communicating what's important to them because we can track it all there. And uh, we have over the years now thousands of customers. There's no way you can remember it. And a spreadsheet or some other system, it's just too hard to access that data. So yeah, yeah, I'm definitely a fan. I'm just very blessed by the way I've positioned myself. I don't need to interface with it myself. It's a great system and program and I would if I had to, but I'm doing other things in my business. Gotcha. If you were if you were selling directly to a customer, but though. I said, "Oh my God, be all over it, right. all over it." Yeah. Okay. So if um if somebody would like to get a hold of you, I mean, obviously they can read all the books. You're like one of the only people I see that like directly gives out a, a link for people to contact you. Uh, but so if they want to find out more about your coaching and mentoring and um and more information about you, how do they find you? Yeah. So if you want to start, the easiest place is to go to my website. It's mikemotorbike.com. My name is Michalow. It's no one can spell it. So Mike Motorbike, <laughs> stories is a nickname from grade school, is the only G-rated nickname I got because it rhymed. I don't like motorcycles. But MikeMotorbike.com, go there. Uh, all my books are there. Um, other information. Plus, there's an opportunity to contact me. Yes, I do respond to my own emails. Um, so you can contact me there if you want to reach out directly. Absolutely fantastic, man. I feel like I've had a star on here. This is really, really cool. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for taking some time out of your day to be my guest on the Owner's Pride Podcast. It's been a joy. Thanks for having me. Holy moly, that was cool. Thank you so much for taking a little time out of your day to listen to or watch the Owner's Pride Podcast. Questions and comments, leave them for us on the Owner's Pride Podcast Facebook page. You can do the same thing if you have show ideas. I would love to hear them. Take a moment, if you would, and hit a like or subscribe button. Write us a review. All of that stuff is so important. And until next time, stay glossy.